Podcasters, assemble! Hello, I am MC, and I am from Best Animated Shows Ever, so far. This is Tyler from the Too Young for This Hit podcast. This is Becky, Troy's wife. My name is Mike Lucas. Also known as Mike Wall Trades. Rob here, your friendly neighborhood comic geek. This is Arjuna Gonzalez from Thoughts from the Level Editor. Hey, this is Travis Bowe from Real Comic Heroes Podcast. I'm Jason from At Drinkopedia Pod. This is Troidal Power from the Power Playthroughs Podcast. And this is Iron Man. 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 Iron Man 1 the big daddy of them all, the inaugural movie in the MCU that has lasted 11 years now. This may be the best of the Marvel films as well as one of the best looking, and that is because it is one of the only films that was actually shot on film. The ones after this were shot on digital, which means the blacks never really are completely black, and the rest of the Marvel Cinematic Universe kind of has a very washed-out tone until you get to, like, Thor Ragnarok and uh, Guardians of the Galaxy 2. Man, what a fantastic movie. You know, you've seen a lot of Marvel origin movies. I think this movie is, first off, it's the first one, but it, it does it the best. You got Tony Stark, who's just the biggest jerk ever. He's this super arrogant, egotistical maniac, and then he gets humbled. I mean, that's that's one of the best Tony Stark moments of the entire MCU. This kid raises his hand and says, hey, is it cool if I take a picture with you? And he's like, yes, it's very cool. And then he's like, and I don't want to see this on your MySpace page. And that made me laugh really hard because I forget that this movie was made in 2008, which was like peak of MySpace. And uh, I loved MySpace, but it's it's funny because most people don't know what that is now or didn't ever use it. So like millennials. I don't know. It's funny to me. He's trapped in a cave with a with a scientist, and they're still working on the Iron Man suit. Unbeknownst to the scientist, that it's an Iron Man suit, you know, thinks it's something else, and they're trying to they're trying to hide what they're actually doing. You know, they're still at this point in time in the movie. They're supposed to be building the Jericho weapon. Uh, for those who've never seen Iron Man before, the Jericho missile. I'm calling it a weapon because it is a weapon. The Jericho missile was a big cluster missile. You know, it was showcased in the beginning of the movie, you know, when he got in a fun V. (laughs) And um, they shot it off. And that's how he got captured. They got blindsided. And so he's in this cave and he's supposed to be building this Jericho missile. But instead, he's literally building the schematics to the exoskeleton, you know, the exo armor uh, Iron Man that that we know and love as Iron Man today. And they've built this Mach 1 Iron Man suit as a way for them to escape from the cave, but they had limited resources to do so, so uh, the the suit takes a lot to actually get on, which I kind of like, because later on it seems like he makes the suit way too easy to get on way too quickly. But in this scene, the instance helping him get the suit all on, and then there's a, an operating system that has to boot up, and they realize that there's no way it's going to finish booting up by the time the guards come. You know... You still need to boot up. We're gonna get you time to. We're gonna get you some time. So, scientist goes out bravely with you know what I'm saying. He gets a gun from one of the guards and sits and and runs out and everything else. And Yinsen runs out and uh, and and uses his machine gun to to chase away all the baddies, just stalling them long enough for for Stark to get the suit powered up. And uh... Tony finally gets in the suit. The suit gets booted and everything, and it's. You know, it's what you expect from being inside of a cave with as little tech, tech and look like they're programming off an old Apple II. And then once once Iron Man comes out, he finds Yinsen there laying all bloody and he's telling him, no, we got a plan, we got a plan. And Yinsen says, this this was always the plan. And so it's like, uh, it's this real sweet moment where it's clear that Yinsen, Yinsen knew he was never getting out of the cave. He was, he was helping Tony to build the Iron Man suit because Tony was going to get out. Yinsen, Yinsen knew he wasn't going to. And the first life, you know what I'm saying, that that Tony actually runs into that kind of significant to him, you know, dies. 
Tony Stark escapes from the Ten Rings camp, and he's got those flamethrowers, and he's setting everybody on fire, and they're firing machine guns at him, but it doesn't do anything, and they, like, keep trying to throw heavier-duty stuff at him, but he's just, like, shrugging it off, and then he flies off as the whole thing just explodes in a giant ball of flames. That was really cool, and a great way to end that first chapter in the story. When Tony Stark comes back from Afghanistan after being a prisoner, and he announces that he'll be shutting down the weapons manufacturing division of Stark Industries. Because that's really important. If he was still doing that today, that would be crazy. Like, how are you going to be a hero and also create weapons of war? Like, that would just be crazy. Also, I feel like war is bad is a pretty good message for a hero to send. Tony um, is walking out of his conference thing that he did, and he pats a man on the back and says, looking great, Hev. And um, man turns around, and it's Stan Lee in a um, bathrobe style like like Hugh Hefner. (laughs) And it's real cute. (laughs) I think one of my favorite moments is when he's first getting suited up in his armor, and you know it's still silver he's testing it out for the first time i think that might be one of the best it's not really an action scene because it's just him testing out his equipment and taking it's just a test flight that experience of like flight and oh man i've done it i'm a superhero now i can basically do anything the thrill of it all i think is kind of unrivaled in any any other marvel movie too just like that exhilaration where in that suit with him, you know, we're flying through, poking through the Ferris wheel. Absolutely amazing. <laughs> and he has his robot helping him um, just in case anything catches on fire. And um, he flies through the roof and then falls back down and crashes to the ground and he gets doused with fire extinguisher. And then he's on round two and he's like, okay. He goes, if you douse me again and I'm not on fire, I'm donating you to a city college. And then he continues to do his tests and does it perfectly. But then after he does it perfectly, the, the, the robot like kind of lifts up his arm <laughs> just a little bit. <laughs> I thought it was cute. <laughs> the first iconic suit up the in the red and the gold uh, outfit. Uh, it's pretty badass. He gets all the um, parts just attached to him by machines. Um, I, I really like this. It's like right where um, that iconic suit that he has in all the other films comes from. Um, so, so the next real action scene then is Tony. You know, just after he's decided to um, go after. The bad guys take the fight to them. When uh, Tony Stark goes back to Afghanistan to rescue the the village with his new Iron Man suit, and he just drops in, like, easily takes out all of the terrorists, and then just leaves. And they do some really cool, like, first-person view shots. It's an amazing scene. You know, he, he swoops down, saves the day, and then dis- destroys uh, missile launchers, takes out all the bad guys, and then continues to uh, wreak havoc after he's blasted out of the sky by uh, tank fire. Has that awesome moment where he just looks down the barrel of this tank, shoots his, his missile you know, straight down the barrel, and then, of course, walks away as it explodes. You know, that's that'll always be one of the the top action scenes or one of the coolest scenes in, in the Marvel universe. The best action scene has to be when um, Tony actually blows up uh, the tank and then turns around and blows up the munitions that um, has been sold to the terrorists uh, that were uh, in a village not too far from where he was being kept. And then even after that, you've got him versus the U.S. military as they're trying to figure out, you know, who went into their uh, active war zone. And after Tony goes on his first kind of mission to blow up weapons uh, in, in the Middle East as Iron Man, 
um, he's he's flying away and gets a call from Rhodey, um, checking in on the situation. Rhodey's like, you know, we just noticed this get blown up. Do you have any tech in the area? Uh, because we've noticed something in a no-fly zone and we're about to blow it out of the air. And you get this great chase scene where Tony is flying the Iron Man suit against a couple of Air Force jets. And I love this action scene because it's a, a cool mix of, of the, the chasing dynamics, but you also get a lot of the first person perspective. This is the kind of the first time you see Tony flying in like an action mode. He gets kind of a test flight scene earlier, but this is really him like flying as an action scene and it's fantastic. But then you also have the really nice protocol of like the communication between the Air Force pilots and the home base where Rhodey's at and all this back and forth. Uh, eventually leading to them shooting a missile at Iron Man. He throws up flares and then grabs on the bottom of one of the jets and calls Rhodey back and is like, don't blow it up, it's me. And he's like, I'm going to blow up your drone. He's like, it's not a drone, it's me, it's a suit. That's a great great bit where it's kind of punctuated by him you know, rescuing a pilot who you know had to bail out and then is also punctuated by a, a great little joke about it being a, a training exercise gone wrong. Already being like, what am I supposed to tell people? And he's like, ah, oh, it's a, a training exercise, right? That's the standard uh, standard line, which of course then they do. They say it was all a training exercise. It kind of makes the uh, final fight between um, Obadiah and Tony kind of dull in comparison. Um, right after his uh, mission to Gomira. He's uh he's been shot, he's been you know, banged up, Pepper finds him. And um he's getting out of the suit for the first time and all the machines are taking the parts off and he turns to uh Pepper and he says, uh, I think the line is You see me doing worse Or you've caught me doing worse, I think it might actually be. Um But uh yeah, that, that's probably my favorite line. It's just a little throwaway comedy line that happens between them. Um, she's, you know, concerned about bullet holes and him risking his life. And he has this moment where, you know, he, he tells her that he knows that he can do this thing and make a difference you know his his life up till now has been about making weapons and destroying things but he knows now that he can be a hero and not be a hero to make himself feel better you know he can be a hero to help Uh, my favorite villain moment um, is when Obadiah, uh, his father's friend and who's been running the business, uh, sort of tells Tony after he gets back from being um, over in uh, captured by the terrorists that uh, he's the one being blocking Tony from taking control back of his company. The brief little interaction that Tony Stark has with Obadiah um, right after the uh, the party that Tony kind of crashes, you know, he's been presented with all this uh, evidence that his company has been supplying weapons to the enemy, and he confronts Obadiah and, you know, asks him, are, are we selling weapons to the enemy, to terrorists? And it's just this little moment that Obadiah has where he kind of treats Tony like, just treats him like uh, you're a fool if you don't realize that, you know, as a company, we have to do these these things and deal uh, under the table and, and sell to both sides. And it's, it's, all, it's, it's perfectly wrapped in this moment of, you know, let's take a picture. You know, he, he's got this smile on his face as uh, photographers are taking their picture and Tony is still blindsided by this whole uh, realization. But Obadiah is able to, you know, smile, make himself look, you know, look good for the, for the press who have no idea what they're talking about. 
it, yeah, I think it's just a, a nice little 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 tease um, for the the villainous acts that he'll uh, he'll get into later on. You you really get a full sense for how evil Obadiah Stane is in the scene where he meets with Raza, the leader of the Ten Rings. Uh, Raza's collected up the pieces of Tony's Mach One Iron Man suit and kind of has them all laid out in a tent. Um, and Obadiah is there to meet with him. Um, we find out here that that Obadiah actually hired Raza and his men to abduct Tony Stark. Um, because he wanted them to abduct him and kill him so that Obadiah could take over the company. And then they tried to basically extract more money from him once they realized it was Stark. Um, but what's cool about the scene as far as what it reveals for, for Obadiah as a villain is he shows up with a whole bunch of men and Raza clearly is like, this is my home turf. I have the upper hand. You leave your men outside, takes him inside. They talk for a while. He shows him the Mach 1 suit. He's talking to the to leader in the camp, and he pulls out this little, like, this little, like, freaking noise synthesizer. Something that just, like, it makes him, like, just death and paralyzes him. And tells him that, don't worry, it'll only last 15 minutes, but you've got way bigger problems. And he walks out of the tent, and all of Raza's men are on the ground, hands behind their head, and uh, Obadiah Stane's men have completely taken over. Um, and he tells his men to pack up the suit. And then he says, all right, let's finish up here. And you hear guns going off. And, and it's pretty clear that, that basically he had this whole, this whole community wiped out. And I mean, granted, this community was not exactly nice people. Uh, but the, the uh, disregard that Obadiah Stane had for, for ordering them all to their deaths was just like showed how like truly evil he was. When Obadiah's team of engineers and scientists are trying to reverse engineer uh, the suit that Tony creates, the Iron Man suit, and um, they're having difficulties making the uh, power source, and um, the guy's like, the technology just, it, it doesn't exist. And then Obadiah just yells at him, I'm going to try and do this. Tony Stark was able to build this in, in a cave. cave. With, with a, a box, box of scraps. scraps. And then just this lowly nerd going, I'm not Tony Stark. I think one, that really establishes Obadiah Stane. And then two, I mean, nobody can be Tony Stark. That's fantastic. And just how Jeff Bridges delivers that line. Uh, it's really amazing. Like I, Every other time I've seen Jeff Bridges in an interview or something, he's just always very like mellow. Seeing, seeing him that like angry and terrifying it was like a really good acting moment. Can we talk about the arc reactor thing real quick? <laughs> how um how Pepper had to reach in and unplug his old his old reactor and plug in the new one and like the goop and stuff all on her hands and and he and she pulls out the old one and he's like not too far not too far clip and she's like what's that he's like you just unplugged today y'all I'm probably gonna die <laughs> that was great. Obadiah takes Tony Stark's heart reactor out and he goes through his little monologue about how he's going to use it to set the balance of power straight again. You really think that just because you have an idea, it belongs to you? Your father, he helped give us the atomic bomb. Now what kind of world would it be today if he was as selfish as you? You know, so he had like, so it was like literally two moments. Where he took out his competition, and then he took out, he thought he took out Tony at that point in time in his own house with, with pizza. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, you know what I'm saying? Not with the pizza there, but they like took him out and left him for dead pretty much. So he could power his own, um, his own recreated Iron Man suit. I, I like the relationship between those two. Like, it's this sort of, I don't know that Tony Stark is a classic nerd character, but it's sort of like a really cool version of the Dilbert versus pointy-haired boss rivalry. Granted, the pointy-haired boss is more incompetent than malicious, but I'm talking in this more general sense of there's this smart inventor type, and then there's a business type who's trying to use all of his knowledge and ingenuity for his own evil purposes, and I like that rivalry in a story. That tease of... Terrence Howard in the, I guess, the Mark II 
uh, Iron Man suit, you know, the, the next time baby, like just, just hearing that moment, you know, in theater for the first time, you know, you just know, oh, he's going to become war machine. Um, and, and the idea that this movie is setting up a war machine, uh, you know, not, not necessarily a spinoff, but you know, they're already planning for the future of the, this, this franchise, you know, regardless of the Avengers of it all. And of course the ultimate dangling thread, you know, is the post credit scene with, with Nick Fury and the Avengers in initiative and how amazing it is that they had the foresight to plant those seeds. But, but the roadie war machine, you know, bit was, uh, was perfectly executed. Of course, Terrence Howard never got a chance to become the war machine, you know, we're probably better off with a Don Cheadle as a roadie. So I won't really get into all that, but, um, just, just the leaving the audience with, uh, the hint of, you know, more, more Iron Man related adventures to come, I think is a, a great little, uh, little moment. Then there's like the beginning of the final battle with Obadiah where you see the evil Iron Man clone suit for the first time, mostly. And that is like, they do a really good job of introducing it and showing how evil the guy piloting it is. And like, all it's just like this really awesome CG sequence that really does stand up 11 years later. I liked it a lot. Iron Man and Iron Monger are flying. Um, they're fighting and they're flying higher and higher and higher into the sky. You know, they're flying out and, you know, you see the, you see the, the brain of Tony Stark, you know, take over while they're in the mid, in mid fight. And he's flying them all the way up past the atmosphere. And, you know, he asks how, how he did he uh, compensate for the freezing in the suit. And Ironmonger is bragging about his suit and how awesome it is and how much better it is than um, Iron Man's. And then Iron Man goes, yeah, so what are you going to do about the ice? <laughs> and Ironmonger starts to ice up and immediately starts falling from the sky. And he's like, what? And then his suit shorts out. Dynamo suit shorts out and he just, he's just falling back to Earth. And I thought that was, like, funny karma. Well, with Wolf, you know, trying to lessen casualties and whatnot, you know, Tony, we, we slowly see, you know, Tony morph from being uh, the playboy, uh, the billionaire playboy philanthropist into, like, an actual hero, like, folding out in our eyes. And for me, that's a big thing. Because, you know, it's, it's storytelling, you know? It's great storytelling in that fight. It's kind of like you know, watching a good play or watching a good dance or, or if you know me, <laughs> watching, watching a good match in wrestling. It's storytelling going on during all this. And the story is becoming, while more that he's just fighting, it's more than he wants revenge. Then it's becoming, it's going from wanting revenge to shutting, to stopping this guy to eventually getting to the point in this fight where he feels like he needs to sacrifice himself to save Pepper's life and to end this fight. At the arc reactor so it's one of those things that you wouldn't you wouldn't have necessarily expected from tony stark from the beginning of the movie but just watching his growth as as a character like you just at the end of it you're just kind of like wow the climax of that fight you just you're in awe the the reporters are all there and he's like He's reading the cards that that Shield, uh, not Sh Shield, they're giving him uh, Coulson, Agent Coulson, they're giving him, and he's reading the cards. And she's like, "Excuse me, but do you really think for, want us to think that?" And he's like, "I know it's hard for you to really believe, but trust me on this when I say, you know." And, she, and mind you, now this is the same reporter that's pressing him that at the beginning of the movie hooked up with Tony, and so she was already bitter because you know she felt some type of way. She woke up. And he was gone, and she was in Jarvis's house, and Pepper Potts was handing her clothes, and 
And so she's the one pressing him about it. And he's just like, you know what? In the back of his mind, he just had this moment, had to have be a moment of clarity where he's like, okay, let's just go with it and see what happens. I'm telling you freaking Stark. Without a doubt, my favorite line of dialogue from this movie is at the very end where Tony Stark is at a press conference and he announces that I'm Iron, Iron Man. Man. And then you hear, and it's, it's amazing because that's, it's, it's your cliffhanger. You know, it's, it sets the tone for what I believe the MCU is comes where we where we've ended up at right now. You know, I really like that they went that direction where Tony Stark is op is out in the open and he's not hiding some sort of secret identity. Just because it's so different. I don't know if I've ever seen any Marvel movie where that's the case. I I'm interested to see where that goes in Iron Man 2. I didn't see that coming. Like, the movie just ends. And I'm like, how are they going to resolve this? Like, he can't just... Everyone can't know he's Iron Man. That's not what superheroes do. Because before this, I had only seen like Daredevil, Spider-Man, um, all the DC movies. Because there were so few Marvel movies at the time. I just never expected a superhero to reveal their identity like that. It was awesome. So I saw the Avengers before watching this. So I know that uh, Tony Stark, Iron Man, joins the Avengers. Um... And I, so it's kind of spoiled for me a little bit, but I'm interested to know what happens between now and that movie in Iron Man 2 and any other installments that happen to feature Iron Man. Also, what does it mean that uh, Tony Stark is out in the open that he is Iron Man and he isn't trying to conceal it as a, as a secret identity or something? It's a standalone movie. It was planned to be, I think, a standalone movie. Uh, but I will say it's the first intro we have of Agent Phil Coulson. You know, when you see the first appearance of Coulson and he's like, you know, and he's like, he like Coulson comes in. Just I love Coulson as a character. Coulson's great. Um, he's, you know, he's cool. He's calm. But he just seems like so bamf. Like he's a bad, bad AMFer. You know what I mean? Uh, I don't think he knew or Marvel knew how much like how important he would be going forward into phase one and just to see him like in his little baby steps uh, is really great. I especially like it now because I'm a really big fan of the Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. TV show. So, so the fact that S.H.I.E.L.D. was established in the very beginning, I think that's really cool. So my favorite dangling thread left in this movie is definitely Nick Fury popping up in the end. At the time, I didn't really know that much about the Avengers I had no clue that they were making a Hulk movie, Captain America movie, and a Thor movie, and that they were all going to be connected. Yeah, that was no news to me. I don't know if that was well known before the movies came out, or that was a surprise to everyone. And anybody who's like a comic book fan, you were like, wait, what? Oh, wait, we're going to get more than one movie? Because you got to think, before this, like the only real like Marvel superhero movies were the Spider-Man movies, uh, the Sam Raimi series at that point in time. And then Blade, which Blade's an amazing Marvel movie, you know, um, the Blade movie. And then I guess we're going to count Howard the Duck too, right? <laughs> I guess we're counting Howard the Duck. In my mind at the time, I just like kind of always thought like um, when I say like Batman movies, like the next one, it was connected regardless of the fact that it wasn't. Or like when I saw Daredevil, I imagined it was connected to the Punisher movie and to Blade and everything. But yeah, this was apparently the first time it was actually happening. The line, Tony says, you know, I just finally know what I have to do. And in my heart, I know that it's right. That, that would just about work for any hero. It, it, that you could, you could put that line of dialogue in Superman in Batman, in Spider-Man, you know, Captain America, it, it works. It, the, the line is, it's not, it doesn't only apply to Iron Man. It just perfectly sums up doing the heroic thing and, and being the hero. For a movie that, you know, you meet Tony Stark and he's a playboy, 
who sells weapons, you know, and, and has one night stands, you know, to, to do a 180 degree flip and be this character who deep down he knows, you know, he's learned how to do the right thing is, uh, I think a pretty significant moment. The casting of Robert Downey Jr. I know that was literally like, I, I think it was John Favreau said, you have to hire Robert Downey Jr. or you don't have me as the director on this film. And it felt like a big risk to take. They wanted to go younger. They wanted to go, um, you know, with somebody they thought was going to be a bigger crowd pleaser. But the casting was perfect. Yeah, there's a there's a reason that Iron Man it, it set up it kicked off this this whole Marvel cinematic universe and I think had it been another another character another actor another lead actor I don't I don't think you could build this I don't think you could build the MCU off of the Incredible Hulk you know it, it came out a few weeks later. But I don't think had the, had it come out first, I don't think that Edward Norton as Banner was as charismatic as uh, a Robert Downey Jr. as Tony Stark, and I, you know, I don't think it was. It obviously it didn't uh, play as well for general audiences. So this was the smart uh, play to to kick the whole thing off with Iron Man, and and really take a, a gamble with this, you know, honestly, a, a, a C-level Marvel hero. You know, he wasn't Spider-Man. He wasn't the X-Men. It was Iron Man. No one was, was clamoring for an Iron Man movie, but Marvel had had to play with what they had, and what they had was Avengers characters. And, you know, it was, it was a smart play to take a chance with uh, Robert Downey Jr. and the character of Iron Man, and it it clearly has has paid off, and it still holds up as being one of the best Marvel movies and a really great comic book movie and a great movie. It's up there with the likes of Indiana Jones, just in, in terms of being a great crowd pleasing adventure movie. So I love Iron Man. I, I think it sits for both myself and the wife as maybe our favorite of all the MCU movies and certainly the most rewatchable. And then lastly, I watched this movie 11 years ago. I was nine years old. And at the time, Iron Man was my favorite superhero, period. Seeing him on the big screen for the first time, pre-Disney, you know, this is Marvel's first endeavor at a major blockbuster summer film. Absolutely unrivaled. In terms of nostalgic value, it's an 11. Come on, Iron Man 1, it's the best, baby. Podcasters Assembled Probably is a production of the We Can Make This Work Probably podcast network. This episode edited and produced by me, Troidal Power. Find more of our shows at probablywork.com and learn how to contribute to future episodes of Podcasters Assembled Probably by looking us up on Twitter as at Casters Assemble. Submissions are always open. Thank you to everyone who was able to contribute to this episode. Be sure to check the show notes for links to all the places you can find them online. I am Iron Man.
Podcasters Assemble probably will return in The Incredible Hulk. I, I love that Jeff Bridges is cast as the big bad villain of this movie because I keep thinking of his character in The Big Lebowski and I'm like, you were the dude! You were supposed to bring the room together, not tear it apart!